Tan Kumbawa. Good evening. <laughs> when I'm in my church in Japan, of course, it's just natural to speak Japanese to everyone because that's what they understand. However, I have to say, in our Sunday morning service, I'll start out with Japanese, and then after an introduction, I have about 10 minutes or so. Sometimes my wife starts getting nervous because it gets longer. I preach in English, where we have some folks that are uh, English-speaking people as their major language, and so we preach in English, or I preach in English at first, and then use the same sermon in Japanese, so they get to hear it twice. So it's, uh, the Lord's really been good. As Pastor mentioned, the Lord has really blessed. Uh, just a real quick update before we uh, get into the Word. Uh, the church in 2005, we were able to buy property. Uh, 2006, we were able to build the building, and the Lord has really blessed. It's a small piece of property when you compare it to the United States, large piece of property when you think uh, compared in Japan, and miraculous piece of property when you think how small our church is. Uh, we shouldn't be able to, humanly, be able to have that kind of property, and yet God made it available for us. And one more part of the miracle is it's completely paid for. Uh, now, we, our church people gathered together, and they helped us with the uh, uh, building, putting the building up. Uh, they took from their savings and loaned to the church and we're paying them back, but the property itself, we paid cash for it. So the Lord is really, really good. It's miraculous. And what God is doing there is just amazing. You, Pastor and, and uh, Mrs. Alquist were there and saw it. You really have to see it. M my description is it really insufficient uh, to, to get you to grasp totally what the Lord is doing there. It's not size, it's not numbers, but what God is doing and working in the hearts and lives of people is just amazing. We've had two people, uh, one has been baptized, another young man, I say young man, he's in his uh, early 40s, uh, was saved, not long ago, about a year, a little over a year ago, I guess, and went through our baptismal course, which is basically a biblical doctrinal course about the Bible, church, the Lord Jesus Christ, the deity of Christ, virgin birth, all of those things, because in Japan, they, many people do not have the past history or experience of going to Sunday school, uh, having any kind of biblical influence whatsoever, and so we take the time to train them before they're baptized. And it generally takes a, about a year to go through the entire course. You say, wow, that's a long time before you get baptized. Well, it is, but it helps to ground them. And then uh, we, they give a testimony of salvation through the course. We generally deal with salvation about two or three times. And this gives us a pretty good grasp of whether they're really saved or not, as best as we are able to tell. And then they give a testimony of salvation before the church, and then we bring it before the church business meeting. They ex vote to accept the uh, person's testimony as, and to accept them in, for membership and baptism. And so then after that, then we schedule a baptism. Now that I'm in the States, I'm here for only about four weeks. Just got here Friday, last Friday, uh, Friday evening, and we'll be leaving on May 22nd in the morning, Thursday, to get back to Japan, be in the pulpit on Sunday. It really doesn't give us much time to uh, just have some breathing time and you jump right back into the work. But when we get back, we'll be scheduling a baptismal for... Th that young man, and so we'll have had two baptized in the relative, within the last year or so. So God has been good. Uh, one other little thing that I want you to pray about. Uh, this church, I think Pastor Alquist started this in our church. We were, the way our church is facing, it's facing a small little tiny road, and it's one house in from the main road. But the back of the church, you can see coming up that main road, you can see the church quite well. 
And so we've been wanting to have a sign out back for people coming up the road would see the building. They've been seeing it, but they don't know if it's a business or whatever it is. It, it's no identifying uh, type structure. So they couldn't tell that it was a church. So we wanted a sign back there. And I think Brother Alquist was the first one to give, uh, to start that goal of having raising funds for a sign out the back of the building. Well, we every year during our uh, Christ's birth, we would take special offerings and it would go for that sign. Well, finally, this past year, we got a sign up out back. And it's not the, what I originally had thought, it's better. Uh, one of the members of our church said, well, what I'd like to see is a, just a cross out there. And then I thought, okay, well then we'll put a cross up there and then we'll have uh, our church name, of course, in Japanese characters and Chinese, uh, what they call kanjis, those real fancy little things, you know, that they use to read. And it's all written out, so we have a cross there, and we have all that Inage Bible Baptist Church written out in Japanese. So people coming up from the main highway and, and tour about probably around 6 o'clock to Oh, maybe 5.30 to 7.30, somewhere now. It gets really traffic jammed there. So they get to sit there and look at our sign. It's really a great testimony. Our cross has a special feature to it. The man is not a Christian that runs the sign company, but he really did a super job for us. He put LED lights. I think there's 54 of them inside that cross and at nighttime it lights up and he suggested and it was a really a great idea to have red led lights and so that sign cross would light up and i saw it, it was really fabulous well i went home the first night that we uh, had that lit up and i went home about two hours or so later I got a phone call, and it was from one of the neighbors. And this neighbor has been very, very opposed to our church. I really don't think he likes Christ. And so he was complaining about the glow of that cross shining over into his yard. There's a equipment rental company behind, and they have kind of a, like, you know, these... Um, building when they're constructing buildings a large building they'll put those metal walls up around so people don't go into the construction site and get hurt and so forth well they have some of those up along his yard and it would shine on that and kind of put a red glow over towards his yard <laughs> and he did not like that so i went there and we shut it off and, but he wasn't satisfied. He wanted to come talk to me. So he came out and he talked to me and he got very, very irate. Uh, I thought at one point, I thought maybe tonight I might suffer for this and have to go to the hospital. That's how upset he was. However, at the same time, uh, this went on for about two hours out in the parking lot there. And during this time that he was venting his anger, the Lord just really spoke to my heart and said, I'm with you. And so that was really fantastic. You know, the Lord is with us. Well, the Lord has settled that all down. Um, we are not able to get the cross on yet. That's what I want you to pray about, that the Lord will open the door. Of course, we don't want to be offensive to anyone, even though um, he's not being reasonable with us about it. We're taking the extra mile. We shut it off, but we're not giving up. Praying, we ask you to pray that God will open the door, that we can get that cross back on. And the neighbor on the other side is relation to this family. And we later talked to them because they ended up getting involved in this that night too. 
And so we went over and we apologized for, you know, the circumstances and everything. And, and the lady, these are not believers now. The lady told us that we have a cross up on the front of our building and it's just a fiberglass kind of a uh, ivory color cross and it has a light on it. And she says, I like that. These are not Christian people. They're Buddhist background. And she said, I like that. And she said, you know, when things settle down, I'll bring that up. I'll talk to them about, you know, if getting that cross back on, light, light it up again. And the, the man who was very irate with me suggested, instead of the red color, that kind of made them nervous, you know, what about, you know, if it's white, that would be okay. Well, this m lady mentioned, well, you know, let's change those to white and then we can light it up. And I said, oh, no, 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 we don't want to cause any problem. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. So she's evidently going to go talk to <laughs> this family about getting that changed to, from red to white and then getting the cross lit up again. Well, okay. <laughs> So pray, please, and Lord willing, we'll be able to get that cross lit up. And it, just from dark till like 10.30, and then it shuts off. So it's not a major deal, really, that would bother folks, but really pray about that. God has been good, though. Um, the Lord never promised us to have an easy time, but he did promise that he'd be with us. And Paul, even, when he went from town to town and ministered, he didn't always have an easy time. In fact, if we were to be traveling with the Apostle Paul, that would have been quite a trying experience. That is, his ministry was really riddled with hardship. Being thrown in prison, beaten, run out of town, all kinds of difficulties, and yet God used him in a fabulous way. Many were saved. Many churches were established. And a great work of God was accomplished. We should not be surprised that we face hardship. It's our human nature to want to just run away when hardship comes. But the Lord never ran away. He just persevered on. And that's what he wants us to do. He is with us. He promised when he gave the great commission to the apostles in Matthew, he told them to make disciples of all nations, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And then he closed with, and lo, I am with you always. That's so critical because we are not wise enough and we are not strong enough in our own selves to accomplish the work that God has given to us. But God is. And God does use weak human beings like us strengthening us, giving us this wisdom that we need to declare the Word of God and see the Word of God work in people's lives. We can declare the Word of God, but we cannot work in people's hearts. We cannot make them want to come to church, want to hear the gospel, want to understand, want to know how they too can be saved and know that they're going to heaven. We can't do that. And once they are saved, we cannot work in their hearts to give them that desire to grow and to mature. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But he uses us. And that's such a fantastic thing. He could have used angels. Angels are far more powerful than we are, far more capable, but God didn't use them for the spread of the gospel directly like he's using us. Now, I'm sure he's using them in various aspects, but he uses us. Why us of all people that are so weak and so limited, and yet he chose to use us? Amen. It's amazing, isn't it? And what a blessing on our part. 
to have that opportunity to team with the Lord and serve him in the place that God has given to us to serve. One of the places that Paul went to, it was a difficult area, but what a fruitful area, and that was Thessalonica. Tonight, I'd like to go to Thessalonica. Before we do, I'd like to pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for what you're doing here in Erie and also what you're doing in Japan, in Inage. Pray that you will bless in a great way. We pray for revival. We pray for folks to be saved in great numbers and God's people to be strengthened and blessed and encouraged in the Word of God every day. Bless this time now. Open the Word of God to our hearts and teach and preach the Word of God to our hearts, meeting every need. And bless in a great way, we pray. Bless this nation in the Word of God. Work in the hearts of people in a great way to see our nation turn back to the Lord and the Word of God and see great results and great victory. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. There's only 10 verses there, and I'd like to read all 10 verses. So if you'd like to turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and I'm going to concentrate on verses 7 to 10, but we want to read the whole thing and we'll get a good picture of what is happening. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. One of the easy ways to find Thessalonians is they've grouped all the T's in one spot. So if you find one T, you'll find the others. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, they're all in one section. So that makes it easy for us to find. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, mentioning, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost." so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. What an amazing chapter that Paul in ten verses could pack in so much. It's just amazing. Paul and Silas, Silvanus, and Timotheus, Timothy, you know, from Derby Lystra, their team, they teamed up as missionaries, and missionary team went up to Troas and up, crossed over to Neapolis and up to Philippi, which was a 
major city of that area. It was a colony city. It was a city that was self-governing and retired Roman soldiers would uh, live there and it was very Roman. That's why they had to go outside the city to worship because they were not allowed to worship in the city. It was just not permitted uh, to any foreign religions were not allowed inside the city. Paul had a great ministry there. He had difficulties. He was thrown in prison. He was beaten unjustly. Folks were saved there. Lydia was saved there. Church was established. From there he went on down to, I believe it was Amphibolus, uh, Amphipolis or something like that, and then on to Thessalonica. Actually, Thessalonica is still there. It's the second largest city in Greece. You can go there right now. They call it Thessaloniki. And it's, the bay is still there, just like it was. The, the city at Paul's time was a large city. Possibly 200,000 people living in the city. Even today, a very large city, quite impressive. If you go online, you can actually see pictures of it. Paul went there, ministered the word of God. Paul says, we give thanks always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. And he says, we give thanks always, thank, giving thanks to God always for you all. Paul had a thankful heart. He didn't dwell on the difficulties that he was having. He didn't dwell on the, the suffering. Well, he mentioned it from time to time. But it was only to encourage and to show that determination for the cause of Christ. It wasn't for pitying himself. He had a difficult time in Thessalonica, as you know. He went there. He had a, just a short time to minister. And some were saved. A church was established, but those that were not saved were not happy with what he was preaching. Unsaved Israelites that lived in that city of Thessalonica cre created a great stir, a great problem, and ran them out of town. The believers had, you know, were having a difficult time in Thessalonica. They suffered for the cause of Christ there. It was not necessarily the work of Christ was not a welcome thing always in Thessalonica. And yet this church was really persevering for Christ and doing a fabulous job for the Lord. Paul then went on to Berea. Berea was a totally different situation. Went into the synagogue, preached the word of God. Those folks there would listen to what he had to say and then check, at that time, of course, the Old Testament, to make sure what Paul was saying was what the Word of God said. And guess what they found? It was exactly what the Word of God says. And many got saved. You, he had the Berean church started. Those unsaved folks, unsaved, unbelieving Thessalonican Israelites, that opposed Paul's ministry preaching the gospel, got wind of Paul being in Berea, they came all the way down to Berea and caused trouble there too. Well, the Berean believers were very concerned about Paul. They took him and some of them escorted him all the way down to Athens. And that's a whole nother story. Oh, wow. Athens. You talk about idolatry. It was just full of idolatry and reminds you a whole lot of Japan. And I wish I had time to share with you how Paul approached the Athens people, the Athenians, with the gospel. Just in brief, though, we, when we go to Sunday school, one of the first lessons that we learn is God's creation, right? God created the heaven and the earth, and the first day he created the light and the darkness and the second day and the third day, each day he created different things. We learn those things. Well, Paul couldn't use the Old Testament 
law and prophets and Moses and show about how Jesus was uh, prophesied to come and die on the cross and all those things. They didn't have that background. Neither do the Japanese. So what he did was use creation. The God that you worship ignorantly, the, to the unknown God, I saw an altar there as I came in. I'm going to declare him to you. The creator of heaven and earth. They could understand that. And that's how he reached them with the gospel. Well, let's get back to Thessalonica. We ran out of town a little bit too early. <laughs> Thessalonica here, he had to leave quick. He didn't have time to strengthen God's people there like he wanted to, and he was very, very concerned for them. But he got a good report from Timothy. He sent Timothy back to see how they were doing, to make sure that they didn't get off, you know, pulled away from the Word of God. And he was so thrilled. And he says, I remember without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the sight of God our, and our Father. Not in the sight of men. In the sight of God. God can see it all. You want to impress God? Follow His Word. That impresses God. He loves that. You know, when we're saved, when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, when we realize we're sinners and we cannot go to heaven, and we realize that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, bearing our sin penalty for us, and completed it, and at the end of it all said, It is finished! and gave up his life in death. He was buried and arose again, physically alive, and is able to save God, our Savior. When you believe that, and you're willing to repent, make that decision, I don't want sin anymore. I want Christ. And you believe on Christ alone for your Savior, and from your heart, you call out to the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive your sin, come into your heart, save you, give you eternal life, be your Savior and Lord. He gladly does that and makes you his own child, gives you a new nature, a totally new creation. He gives us righteousness, his righteousness, because our righteousness is nothing more in God's eyes than filthy rags. That means bloody rags. You wouldn't even want to touch it. You just want to burn it. That's our righteousness. Imagine what our unrighteousness is like in God's eyes. He gives us His righteousness, His joy, His love, His eternal life, which never ends because He lives, we shall live also. And he wants us to live in that righteousness. He's given that righteousness, his righteousness to us. He wants us to live in that righteousness every day. That impresses God. He loves that. Paul says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. That's what we want to do. He sees our hearts. He sees our motivations. He sees our weaknesses, our strengths. He sees our life day in, day out, constantly. In the sight of God. That's how we live. And he goes on saying, for our gospel came not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. You know, when we hear the word of God, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's our job. How shall they hear without a preacher? Paul tells us. 
It's our job. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. No, but you're a believer. And you are a missionary. You're a missionary where you live and to the people you know. And they're seeing your life. Paul preached the Word of God, not in word only, not in man's wisdom, not in the just nice oratory that you feel like, wow, that was really nice. And you go home and you forget about it. But in power, how does the power, the Word of God, be released in a person's life? Well, really, from what I can understand so far, it's quite simple. When we preach the Word of God so that people understand the Word of God, the Holy Spirit then works mightily in that person's hearts, heart and deals with them about their need for salvation or as believers, us to grow in the Lord. Paul said, I'd rather preach five words in a language that you understand than 10,000 that you don't. What if I came here and I preached my entire message in Japanese? Well, probably, unless some are lis listening online that understand Japanese, and, and my daughter would be blessed by it. But other than that, the first three or five minutes, you think, wow, that's really neat. And then after that, your concentration becomes tired and you start nodding off because you don't understand a thing I'm talking about. Right? Paul said, I'd rather preach. How much time do I got? Oh, I've got to hurry. Five minutes. No, five minutes. Five words. <laughs> In a language that you understand, than 10,000 that you don't. When you understand the Word of God, the Holy Spirit begins to work in a mighty way in people's hearts. Paul said, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Paul didn't just preach and just do what he wanted. He lived the righteousness of Christ before them. He was an example of what he was preaching. And that's a powerful message in itself. People will listen to what we are living far ahead of what our words do or what our words say. We want to have both of those. And on he goes, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. It was not easy for them to decide for Christ. There was persecution and affliction in that town. But what happened to these folks? Did they quit? Did they give up? Oh, no. Let's go on. So, verse 7, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, Macedonia is the northern section of Greece. Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, that northern section. Achaia is Athens, Corinth area. Thessalonica is up north, not far from Philippi. And yet these believers were so impacted by the Word of God and living the Word of God that their testimony just blossomed out to all of Macedonia and all Achaia and even probably across the sea over to what is now western Turkey over into those areas like Ephesus. Wherever they went, they took the word of God with them in their life and their words. They declared the word of God. And Paul said, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Paul goes into a town, he begins to preach the word of God, and he says, oh yeah, we've heard that. Well, where'd you hear that? Oh yeah, this fella from Thessalonica, he's been here, he's been telling us about that. 
That's way, the way God wants us to be as believers. For they themselves show of us, verse 9, what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There's repentance. We see what kind of ministry and impact we've had in your lives because your life shows it. You were idolaters before. You worshipped metal and stone and gold and wood and you turn from that to serve, believe on and serve the true living God, the God that made the heavens and the earth. And to wait for his son from heaven. He's coming back. Amen. Now, this word in samples in verse 7 is a unique word. And it's particularly good for this area. Because it, what it means is to die cast. Like a die. You have a metal die and you imprint metal or wood or something. And it makes that imprint over and over, the same imprint, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. That's what he's saying. You are die cast, making an imprint on all that were in Macedonia and Achaia. That's the kind of testimony and ministry that we as believers want to have. In verse 8, from, for from you sounded out that means to reverberate. It wasn't just a one time or several good times where they were great testimonies for Christ and then they kind of laxed off. and then They lived it. It was a living. That was what they were and what they are and that's what they did. You look at the Thessalonican believers, you saw Christ in them. That's what they were and that's what they did. That's what the Lord wants from us too. To wait for his son, verse 10, from heaven. He's coming back. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The resurrection of Christ. He's alive. He's coming back. And because of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, people in Erie, people throughout the United States, people in Japan, people throughout the world can be saved from the wrath to come, and that wrath is coming. God explained that it is, and we certainly don't want to have any part of it. Now is the time to be born again. Now is the time to accept Christ as your Savior. And for us as believers, tonight, go home, Reread chapter 1. Allow the testimony of the Thessalonican believers to really soak into your hearts and allow the Lord to develop that same thing in you and allow God to work through you to this area so that this area will say, oh yeah, I've heard that. Those people from Calvary, Grace of Calvary, Baptist Church, they have been telling me about that. And folks that are not here right now, these chairs that are still empty, will one day have people that are right now totally uninterested in the Word of God, here, saved, worshiping God and learning the Word of God with you in the same way in Japan. There's nothing different. Same gospel, same need. God's working. Thank you for praying and for supporting us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the Word of God. We need it to keep our hearts strengthened and on track and doing a good job for you. Bless the Word of God in our hearts like you did the Thessalonican believers. Pray for souls to be saved and God's people to be strengthened every day in your Word and do a mighty and fabulous work of revival through God's people here and through our church in Inage. Many be saved. 
great work of God be accomplished. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you've just heard a powerful presentation of the word. Let's stand together. We're going to sing number 470 in our hymn books. And as we take these hymn books, let's stand together, please. And as we sing, perhaps the Lord's spoken to your heart tonight, dear Christian, and you want to come and say, Lord, I need to be more like Paul. I need to be more on fire for the Lord, a better witness, a better testimony, a better example. I, I need people to see Jesus in me, not just hear about him once in a while, but to live for the Lord before those people who are watching me. And perhaps you're here tonight and you need to be saved. You've never been born again. Why don't you get saved tonight? Just like those people in Thessalonica and Berea and all those other places. God's still working. He's still saving. Perhaps tonight you'd like to have Christ as your Savior. If you'd like to talk to somebody about it, I want to meet you right here at the front. We'd be glad to spend a little bit of time with you and show you from the Bible how you can know absolutely, positively, for sure that you're going to heaven when you die. All right? You do what God wants you to do as we sing on the first. Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This Yeah.